welcome to the latest episode of Intellectual Conversations with Jason Sylvester. I'm your host. Joining me today is my favorite Old Testament scholar, John Collins, who's the retired Holmes Professor of Old Testament and Criticism, sorry, Old Testament Criticism and Interpretation at Yale. He's now the Professor Emeritus. Uh, he's retired. Uh, he's written several books on the Old Testament, of which I've read. Uh, they they inform a lot of my thinking. So thank you, John, for being here. I know we've talked before on other podcasts, but this is for my own channel. Um, so as I mentioned to you, I caught you, you were on the Myth Vision podcast recently, and you were talking about the clues in the book of Jonah that it shouldn't be taken seriously. And that really intrigued me. So I thought, okay, let's, how about, you know, it's been about a year or two since you and I last had a chat. So I thought, let's get John on again. So welcome to the show, John. And appreciate your time. Here. Yeah, so maybe you can, you can enlighten us a little bit on these, these clues that are in Jonah that this, this is a story that we should not take seriously. Well, I think uh, the obvious one is the idea of somebody being swallowed by a big fish and then vomited up again. Now, I suppose, you know, if you can say, oh, that's perfectly reasonable, something that might have happened, <laughs> then we live in different worlds. <laughs> I don't know where we'd go from there. But I think, you know, it's like the talking snake and the Garden of Eden. Uh, right. if, if you don't get it, that that's, uh, that that's a sign of fiction, then I think you've really got a problem as a reader. Right. So, well, that's I think that's an issue with you know you live in the U.S. Yes, uh, a problem with with the evangelical yeah. Christian movement primarily in the U.S. that they they have these literal understandings. So, and there's as you and I were chatting just offline before we started, you know the the anti intellectual strain that you see in Christianity. Like you, we have many early thinkers. Uh, like John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople, saying, clear your mind of secular reasoning. So we, and there were, like, was it Origen? Origen himself, like, you know, was criticizing people who who said we should take the Bible literally, particularly the the creation stories. So that's um, among among non-evangelicals. Is, is it fair to say that a majority of, of people in the Judeo-Christian tradition would, would accept these stories allegorically and not literally? It's mostly the well, evangelicals uh, that do I it. don't think uh, allegory is really the alternative. I mean, that was yeah. the alternative for people like Origen and Philo yeah. of Alexandria. People, you know, who were intelligent people and who knew very well that you couldn't take all of this stuff literally. Uh, but then they... Uh, wanted to allegorize it, in which case you kind of read in the meaning that you want into the text. <laughs> now, uh, there, there was a very good article that, that formed a lot of my thinking on the book of Jonah, in particular by Jack Miles. I don't know if you ever heard of the man. Um, he won a, a Pulitzer Prize for a book called God, a Biography. That was maybe 20 or 30 years ago. But he had been trained as a biblical scholar, and uh, he um, uh, he had a very good book on the humor in the book of Jonah. And, you know, once you read it that way, if you come to the book of Jonah after reading through the prophets, reading through several of the prophets, you know, the prophets all take themselves very seriously. And, you know, if God tells a prophet to do something, he does it. Not Jonah. When God gives Jonah a command to go one way, he goes the other way. Then when he's on board the, the ship, you know, it's the, the, uh, the pagans are the good guys. You know, and they're reluctant to throw him overboard. And, you know, at every point, it confounds your expectations ending with God being compassionate to the Assyrians. Now, to be compassionate to the Assyrians would take considerable uh, broad-mindedness, shall we say. <laughs> you know, the Assyrians had not been nice to other smaller peoples in the ancient Near East. Uh, and But, you know, at the, the end of it, God says, well, you know, that there were lots of people in Nineveh who were who don't know their right hand from their left, and what about the animals? 
So, you know, it, at every point in the book, it kind of goes against your standard expectation. And it's that sense of irony that, that really makes it a great book. Right. And so the, these ironic clues should be this, the, the, you know, assigned to the people reading it that this is, you know, some, a story that you should not take seriously. There's, mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's a metaphor in this story that you should be paying attention to, not, not the but, literal. Yeah. That you should not take it literally. Right. Uh, I think you should probably take it seriously because really the book is an argument for more tolerance. You know, for a, it's against making the sharp black and white division of humanity that you get in so much of the Bible. And, you know, in a lot of the Bible, Gentiles do not come off well. Now, Jonah is much more tolerant of them. Um, let's look just at the, 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 uh, the ending of the book. Um, he says, you are concerned, they got to Jonah, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, uh, and also many animals. Now, of course, it's not very complimentary to the Assyrians to say that they don't know their right hand from their left, but uh, at the same time, it's better than regarding them as evil people who ought to be destroyed which is probably the way most people in, not only in Israel, but most people who had been conquered by the Assyrians would feel about them and the justification. So that, that's what's going on in Jonah. It's really an attempt to humanize prophecy. So in my introduction to the Hebrew Bible, I put Jonah at the end of the prophets as a kind of meta-prophetic book you know, as a kind of commentary on prophecy, to put it in, in perspective. Well, given, given that Jonah is so different from the other books, is, is there, are there any scholarly theories on why it was picked to be included in the canon? That, uh, you know, I, I really don't know uh, why, why it was picked. You know, I can well imagine, you know, it's a colorful story. And there are quite a few stories in the Bible that are included just because they are colorful, good stories. Uh, so I think you know, the way the canon formed, to my mind, is that certain things caught on. You know, it's like, uh, say, the Oxford Book of English verse. Now, you know, the editor may have some discretion on what he includes, but most of it is pretty much set because some things are accepted and some things aren't. And it's, it's kind of a popularity contest. It's a matter of, of the, the degree of acceptance that, uh, that some material has, uh, has found. And so Jonah must have caught on this way. Now, I am somewhat afraid, you know, that. Uh, and some people in antiquity probably did take it quite literally. Uh, you should never underestimate the gullibility of people. Uh, and indeed, they've continued to take it quite literally down through the, the centuries. There's a very good book on Jonah by Yvonne Sherwood, uh, Jonah, The Lives of a Biblical Prophet, I think it's called. And it's on the different ways it was interpreted. And so, you know, for people like Origen, it seemed obvious that Jonah was really an allegory for the resurrection. Now, for a modern uh, reader who isn't prone to allegorizing, that seems just crazy. Yeah, especially since 
you know, they have, would have had no idea that Jesus was coming several hundred years later to be resurrected. So, <laughs> and see, at that point, you get into the question of what what is scripture anyway? Uh, but for people like Origen and for, for most early Christians and for Jews of that period, this was timeless material that God had kind of put in a time capsule and the meaning of which would only become apparent centuries after it was written. And there are still people who look at the Bible that way. Now, if you look at it, on the other hand, as something that was meant to make sense at the time when it was written, then it, uh, you know, I figure it had a much more humane, much less, in some ways, you might say less profound, but uh, maybe in other ways more profound. Meaning. Well, actually, brings brings me back to the point you made on, on like on the prophets. So I I can't recall. So you you and I've been emailing each other for like well over a decade now uh, that you've been helping me. Um, I can't remember if I've asked you this question. I do. I came across it first in Dermot McCulloch's book, uh, Christianity: The First Three Thousand Years, and then in the last year or two, Bart Ehrman also made a he made a post on it, discussing that the that the prophecy is now at the time in contextual you know at the time it was written prophecy means to interpret the divine will it is not a forecast a you know the the word prophecy today has this connotation that you're somehow forecasting the future but but uh, Dermot McCulloch and both Amron both made the point that prophecy no means to interpret the divine will in your like something is happening right now and the prophets are writing about like you know the assyrians are attacking what what does this mean and that that is the meaning of prophecy so do you I, what i'm kind of curious is about and i I've, I've looked around but i couldn't find it do you, do you know when prophecies kind of changed its meaning and 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 jews and christians started thinking that these prophecies are referring to something in the future and they're not what the prophets were talking about in this period of time? Like, do you know when that shift happened? Well, I know that it had happened by the second century before Christ. Okay. Uh, we have, because from the Dead Sea Scrolls and even already in the book of Daniel, you can see some of it. Where, uh, at, because at that time, point you know it gets to be regarded as the words of god rather than the words of uh, the human person it has something to do with the the rise of writing and the fact that the shift from it being an oral genre which it originally was to being written scripture you know, I had a nice story while I think of it. When I moved to Yale 25 years ago, um, I was invited to speak as a Baptist church. The minister had gone to Yale Divinity School. And, oh, would I do a series? Well, this didn't transpire. But um, I spoke on prophecy. And I talked about Amos, kind of prophecy 101. Amos is your classic example of somebody, as you said, who is speaking to the problems of the day right now. Uh, and that, that, that was his, his mission. And there were three ladies in the congregation who were just shaking their heads. And at the end, when I stopped uh, speaking, one of them said, why didn't you talk to us about prophecy? And I said, I did talk to you about prophecy. That's what prophecy is. I said, no, no, prophecy is what the book of Revelation has to say about the end of the world <laughs> and, what's, uh, and when that's going to happen. And uh, so th I was never invited back to that Baptist church, which was fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but so that attitude isn't entirely dead. But I think, you know, it is that the development of that attitude has something to do also with the canonization of scripture, if we may call it that. And it's not a formal declaration that this is scripture, but a change in attitude. That sometime in probably the Persian period, but after the Babylonian exile, sometime, uh, you know, this material got written down and was being passed on. 
And once it was, it was no longer, people had very little sense of the historical context of the past. They had very little sense of it and very little interest in it. So when they picked up something and it said that God said something, their assumption was that must be for us now. Now, this is very clear in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, you, you get it already, maybe the first clear example of it is in the book of Daniel, when it says in Daniel chapter 9 that Daniel was reading the prophecy of Jeremiah, that Jerusalem was to be desolate for 70 years. And as the author of Daniel saw it, Jerusalem was still desolate several hundred years later. Uh, now, you know, from a historical point of view, you may dispute that, but this is the way he saw it. And so the angel explains to Daniel, actually, when it says 70 years, that means 70 weeks of years, or 490 years. Now, this is a great hermeneutical trick, because it means prophecy is never wrong. You just have to reinterpret it. And you find out. And somebody actually described this as charitable interpretation. That you interpret it on the assumption that it cannot be wrong, it must be right, and therefore it must mean what actually transpired. And you get an awful lot of that then in the interpretation of prophecy. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have a, a genre called Pesharim, commentaries, uh, in which they say, you know, that God spoke to Habakkuk. But God didn't actually explain to Habakkuk what he was talking about. This was only discovered by the teacher of righteousness, who was the sectarian teacher of the Dead Sea Scrolls, several hundred years later. And it was really about the things that were happening in the, in the, the first century BC. Now, that's the kind of mentality that endured, and you still find it in many places. But I think it so, came uh, it came in, in large part from the writing down of prophecy and the loss of historical context. There but are, you, would think, you would think the Bible, like those early stories like Samuel King's, would provide some of that historical context to them once these stories are written down. But a lot of that... <laughs> is fictionalized as well. Like there's lots of elements of non-history that are wrapped up in those stories and you know, how they would like it to be. Chronicles even more so. Like I, I take that quote from you uh, from short introduction to the Hebrew Bible that the chronicler writes history the way he wants it to be uh, rather than what actually happened. So yeah, so yeah I guess over time, like they've, they've forgotten what's, you know, they don't have the history books and the, the internet like we did when, you know, way back then. To look stuff up. And, and also, you know, I think what Chronicles is doing would also count as charitable interpretation. Now, you take, for example, the story of Solomon. Uh, now, you read Solomon in the books of Samuel and Kings. You know, he's not that nice a man. Uh, and David also, you know, David and Bathsheba. This just doesn't show up at all in Chronicles. There's a lot of whitewashing, where in the the older scripture, you know, they, they were fascinated by the number of sexual liaisons Solomon had. That's all gets swept under the carpet in um, in Chronicles. It just would not be appropriate from the viewpoint of the chronicler to talk about that kind of thing you will still find religious people who look at things that way, that some things you know, are not, not appropriate, not suitable. My predecessor at Yale, Brevar Childs, who is a great scholar in many ways, uh, but he objected to the use of social scientific and social critical methods in interpreting the prophets. Uh, another of one of my teachers, Paul Hansen, had, had uh, done a, a master's degree at jail. And Paul went on to write about prophecy after the exile. And he, as he constructed it, there were two parties, both of them represented in scripture, 
who were really going at each other and were viscerally opposed to each other. And Child's reaction to this was, this isn't an appropriate way to read scripture. You know, that, that you, you, you just don't, don't look at it that way. Well, that seems you, you to be kind of a limiting, a limiting way, would it not? Like if, to, to take that out of your toolkit, I mean, you're, you're going to miss like some key, key context by not doing it that way. Well, you know, it, it depends um, what, what you think the purpose of this literature is. And I think people who think of, I think in terms of sacred scripture, often assume that it's you know, historically accurate, morally edifying, and internally coherent. <laughs> no. And it's none of the above. <laughs> I mean, it may be occasionally, but not consistently. Now, yeah. it's historically accurate that usually gets people upset if they haven't discovered that before. You know, the idea that the walls of Jericho did not come tumbling down is kind of nope. devastating to people who grew up believing that it did. Yeah. But actually, once you get over that, that's not such a big deal. You know, there's lots of good literature that isn't historical. What's really much more troubling, I think, is the morally edifying. And that is where you're more likely to get serious distortion in the interpretation of scripture. This, you know, is part of the, the issue with the book of Jonah, that there are people who would think it's not uh, morally edifying, you know, to, if Jonah is vomited up by a fish, I mean, that's funny. <laughs> if you think about it, but it doesn't make him look very dignified. And there are people who think, well, you can't have a prophet. Uh, you know, it, this must have some spiritual meaning. And a lot of the, the uh, there's a lot of effort putting into saving the appearances of scripture when it really ends up just kind of missing the point. Well, I think that's part of the problem with, with religion in general, right? Is the, the masses... <laughs> Missed the point, and even a lot of the priests and the imams and you know rabbis, they missed the point too. Like, isn't isn't that's? I mean, you study the Old Testament. That's one of the the foundational uh, methodologies of rabbinic Judaism, right? Is like this: the rabbis would disagree with each other and talk and discuss and and look at these points from you know diff different perspectives and, and different interpretations. Yeah. This was probably the great contrast between the Judaic tradition or the Hebraic tradition and the Greek tradition. You know, as the Greek tradition was systematizing. And this is what was taken up in Christianity by and large. You know, whereas the, whereas the, the, Hebrews, the Hebrew tradition was concerned with doctrine. And you mentioned it with the writing, so I've I've heard a couple of different theories. So one, they say Ezra, the I guess he was the chief priest in the in the post Babylonian yeah. exile, com, coming back from Persia yeah. after Cyrus, uh, that he was sort of the first redactor to start compiling. But I, I've also heard as well that that the Hebrew Bible, you know, in the form we see it with the books that it contains, doesn't really emerge until like second century CE. Is that Correct from your your understanding. Uh, yes, yes, but now nobody would say that Ezra was 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 responsible for the whole Hebrew Bible. Right, just the, no. getting it started. It was the the Torah, the Pentateuch. The Torah, okay. The the Book of the Law, and so I, so Ezra put the first five together, and then everything else. The, the rest of the, the Tanakh comes, comes later over time. Comes later, years. and some of it very obviously later. Right. Now, again, you're the book of Daniel. Uh, if you were a hardcore fundamentalist, you would probably insist that the book of Daniel was written during the Babylonian exile, but no critical scholar believes that because, you know, you have predictions supposedly made in the 500s B.C., all of which are concerned with a few years in the 160s. And so, you know, you wonder why would the prophecy have just zoomed in on those couple of years, a couple of, uh, a 
couple of centuries later. Right. And already in antiquity, some people figured out that this was because that is when the book was actually written. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are other books, say um, uh, the book of Koheleth, which uh, didn't even get accepted as scripture or was still disputed by the rabbis at some point. But there you, know, you will have some Persian words. Uh, you may have an occasional Greek word that slips into uh, the later writings. So th there's plenty of material that is fairly obviously later than the time of Ezra. Right. So, so that part isn't really controversial. Now, whether Ezra, in fact, uh, was the person, you know, I think, I think that the biblical claim that Ezra brought back the book of the law is probably correct. It doesn't mean that he was the one who composed it necessarily or put it together, but it had been put together evidently by Jews in Babylon. The and book of the law being Deuteronomy. It, they, well, it'd be Genesis through Deuteronomy. Okay. And it may not have been exactly in the form in which we now have it. This is, is one of the, uh, the things that bothers us more and more uh, with all ancient literature is, you know, the copies of the ancient literature that we have come from centuries later than the time we think they were written. And things do change over time. Right. Now, and there's insertions into earlier books as well from later periods that don't indeed, fit. Indeed. Yeah. So, but I think what Ezra brought back was probably something fairly close to what we now have. In, uh, in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible. And then other things, you know, by the, ta by the second century BC, they had a category of the prophets. And again, there might be some debate as to just what was included in that. Uh, ben, the, the prologue to Ben Sira refers to the law and the prophets. And now Ben, ben Sira lived probably before Daniel was written. Uh, the prologue was probably written somewhat later, and by then Daniel might have even been included in them. But that's, you know, the, you have some always some controversy as to just what was actually there. But you did at least have the law and the prophets. And then you had a broader category of writings, and that rambled on into the early part of the Christian era. And that is why you have a difference nowadays say, between a Catholic Bible and a Protestant Bible. The Protestant Bible, by and large, goes back to what was in the Hebrew Bible for the Old Testament. And the Catholic Bible includes books that were written in Greek, and some of which were fairly obviously late, like the books of Maccabees, which even describe things that were happening in the second century BC. So, you know, that, uh, some people would say, in fact, there was never really that firm a line drawn as to just where scripture ends. And you will get disagreement about it to the present day. And even, even different, different denominations have different books, like the Protestants don't have the same Bible as the Catholics, and you know, I'm sure the Orthodox have a different set of books as well. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Well, you just you just reminded me of one thing that I, I came across this back you know, 2008 2009 when I was doing my research so I, I can't remember where I, I first saw it it may have been in one of your books um, but it mentions that the the difference between the Christian Old Testament and the Hebrew Bible is the ordering of the books that the ordering of the new tree of the Old Testament of the Christian Bibles the books were deliberately altered so that Micah would be last to feed into Mark. Do you know when that happened? I, like, I tried looking for that, uh, tried to find some more information, but I, I couldn't find anything. Like, so like, was this like when they created the New Testament, like, you know, it was 367, I think Athanasius was the first sort of to put the 27 of the New Testament together. Is that kind of when they decided to, to shuffle the Old Testament like a deck of cards and, and reorder the books? Uh, you know, I would think that that can't have happened until they started having really long scrolls where you could put everything. 
you know, in a particular order. Because most of the time, say in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you, know, you have individual books. Now you might have the 12 prophets together, the 12 minor prophets, but nothing bigger than that. And so it doesn't become an issue at that point whether the prophets come before the writings. So it has to be later than the acceptance of the writings, uh, probably later than Athanasius, I would think, but probably somewhere around that point. Yeah. And, uh, but it's really, you know, when they start putting the whole Old Testament together, uh, like one book. And I'm not sure when that happened. That mightn't have been until the Middle Ages. Yeah. I'm sure some scholar somewhere has that, like, filed away in their in their brain somewhere. Probably. Just, it'd, be, it'd be an interesting thing to find out when and where it happened and, like, who did it if we, if we even have that information of when it would happen. Because I think it was, a, I thought it was really interesting. And it was a surprise. So one of my family friends, so at, at the, we were chatting offline that I grew up in the United Church of Canada. The minister of my church and and his wife they're very close friends of, of my family my, my parents and me and i remember she she i had mentioned that to to the wife who's also you know she's been to you know bible school like she's also an educator herself uh and she was shocked like she had never heard that fact that the the, the ordering of the books between the old testament and the hebrew bible is different I and mean, you would think someone who's lived her whole life in the church would would, would know something like that and she didn't and it shocked her so. you know one of the things that constantly amuses me is how little people who really believe that everything in the bible is true how little they actually know about what's in it yeah you know but for the most part they don't read it carefully at all. You know, they read it in light of what they already believe. Uh, back early in my career, I taught at DePaul University in Chicago. And at the time, they had a very good basketball team. And one of their star recruits came to DePaul because he wanted to study the Bible. He was a self-ordained Baptist minister. And a very, very nice guy. But he came up to me after an exam one time and he said, man, can I just write it my way? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm sure, you know, that's what he did preaching, was he preached it his way. And it just confused him then to, to, to think that there might be a whole other way of reading it. Yeah. Well, that's actually an interesting point. I've, I've discussed this with Greg Dawes, who's been on the, on this podcast with me previously. Uh, he was formerly a Catholic priest before. He, he's also a professor as well. He teaches philosophy and religion uh, in New Zealand. Uh, but he had been a Catholic priest. And we, we had had a podcast oh, about three or four years ago where he was talking. And I think it was it might have been offline. It wasn't actually part of the podcast where he discussed about how, like, you know, you learn all of these things in seminary and, and Bart Ehrman talks about this in one of yeah. his books. Dan, Daniel Dennett wrote a paper called Preachers Who Are Not Believers that yeah. talk about these, like you learn all of this stuff in, in seminary school, divinity school, and then you get up in the pulpit and you just keep your mouth shut. Like you don't talk about the historicity that you learned. So. You know, that, uh, that minister who had invited me to speak on prophecy would be a classic example of that. He had gone to Yale Divinity School. He had learned, you know, even Brevar Childs, who had a fairly conservative approach to the Bible, would nonetheless certainly uh, be clear on what prophecy was and would not have, uh, he would not have tolerated a fundamentalist uh, reading of the Bible. But when this man found himself in the pub, pulpit and he looked out and he saw some ladies who thought that prophecy was really prediction of the end of the world uh you know he figured he would give his audience what they wanted he was not going to upset them yeah, the, uh, uh, this is one of the great frustrations of teaching the bible yeah the um <laughs> So I mentioned uh, my so offline before we get started. So for the people who are watching and wondering what the hell we're talking about, uh, I mentioned offline that I, I grew up in the United Church of Canada. It's a fairly moderate mainstream. 
the the current minister of my parents' church. So I was I went home uh, last summer to visit, and I met him. Um, and he actually gave me a copy of a book that he'd written, talking about like you know what is the future of Christianity looking like as as atheism and the nuns are are growing in demographics and Christianity is declining. Like what what can we do like to save Christianity? And I was really amazed at the honesty in his book. Like he talked about things like you know Jesus probably was not the Son of Man, was not the Son of God. These are Jewish terms that get misinterpreted. You yourself in um, your mm-hmm. your deconstruction of the Book of Daniel. In the short introduction to the Hebrew Bible, you talk about uh, the Son of Man being Michael, like in, in Daniel chapter 12. It's Michael that's the Son of Man. When Jesus is referring to the Son of Man, he's talking about, he's talking apocalyptically from the book of Daniel that Michael's coming. He's not referring to himself. So it's, it's interesting to see that there are a handful of, of honest ministers and priests out there, but I would say they're the minority. You know, most of them just get up there and they spew the party line and the, they don't actually talk about the kind of history that people like you and Bart Ehrman and, and others have done. So, which is, it's quite frustrating, I would think, for, from your perspective as well, I would think it must be frustrating. That, you know, sure it is, because people have been teaching the Bible critically now for 200 years. Uh, certainly in, say, the last 100 years, you know, there was the great fundamentalist crisis in the 1920s. Uh, and, uh, you know, by the, the usual narrative, the Scopes monkey trial was kind of the downfall of fundamentalism. Only, of course, it wasn't. Fundamentalism is alive and well and wasn't. Uh, but, Project but was, 2025. Yes. You know, there was a clear split between fundamentalists and the rest. And there hasn't really been much progress in a way. Uh, I mean, I would like to think that more people now are familiar with the critical approach to the Bible, but I'm not sure how far that is actually true. You know, there is a huge failing phalanx of uh, uh, of conservative evangelicals out there uh, who haven't changed much at all. Yeah, well, we see the same but, thing in, in the in the Catholic Church, like in the in the 20th century, the the fight against modernism that finally culminated it in Vatican II that, you know, even even multiple popes, like up through Pius XII, were saying, you know, you can't use the historical critical method that's going to contradict Catholic, established Catholic teaching. So, I mean, even the Catholic Church kind of went through, you know, that sort of fundamentalist that, you know, we, we have to silence the modernists. So, that, Yes, yeah. and I think, you know, the battle lines in the Catholic Church have changed. They're not so concerned about the historicity of the, certainly not of the Old Testament uh, anymore, but now it's it's a focus on a couple of moral issues. And yeah. again, you get very different uh, uh, perceptions. Uh, there is a block of American cardinals, you know, who are very critical of the present Pope. And uh, very conservative, a man named Raymond Burke was a ringleader of these. Um, and uh, that you would think that the whole that the whole mission of Christianity was to prevent abortion. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, whereas on the other hand, there's kind of the social gospel that came out of Vatican II. And, you know, further down the hierarchy, there are a lot of priests and nuns who are very dedicated to that with a completely different view of of what uh, Catholicism is about. It's a lot like what's happening in the U.S. more generally. I'm afraid, and probably in other places too, I'm not sure if that has really affected either, um, uh, if it has affected Canada or places like Australia and New Zealand to the same degree. But there is very much a sharp split between those, you know, who want certainty. And a lot of the attraction of the Bible was that it was thought to provide certainty. Yeah. And Karen, then, uh, Karen Armstrong's book, the, the Battle for God, deals with the fundamentalism and the three monotheistic faiths. And she, she makes the claim that uh, evangelical fundamentalism was born out of the Princeton Theological Seminary in the mid 1800s during the industrial revolution because society was changing so fast and and these people were so afraid that 
they needed that cast iron certainty of the Bible. And that's where this evangelical fundamentalism comes from, is that that need for some something rock hard to hold on to. I think that's right. It's a good book on fundamentalism by James Barr. Did you ever read any of James Barr's book? No, don't. Know. James Barr was a Scottish biblical scholar. He died uh, maybe 25 years ago. Uh, he was a very, could be a very acerbic critic. You know, he was really trained in uh, linguistic analysis and that kind of philosophy. And um, he could really dissect nonsense better than just about anybody. Uh, and and he, he was very critical of a lot of biblical theology. But he also had a very good book on fundamentalism which made essentially that point, you know, that it's really a quest for certainty. And I think that's what's going on again at the moment, is that certain things are changing. You know, that uh, people now are confronted with people who say they're transgender, which was something that was never even heard of when I was growing up. And this is very upsetting for people. And uh, probably everything that's going on with the internet and globalization, the constant intermixing of races, um, that this has been, this is one of these waves of change. This was probably what gave rise to apocalypticism already in antiquity. And it's what, what's giving rise to the conservative backlash now. And I think Christianity is not at all immune from any of that. It's just part of it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you see it throughout its history, the, the reactions and the changes. And, and that's one of the things that got me into studying religion is one, it's one, it's historical impacts. But what really captured my attention was how religions change over time, that something happens or a, a book gets written and, you know, or a political or a natural disaster. Yes. And it, it changes how how religion is perceived or how it evolves, like I said, with the Industrial Revolution and the birth of evangelicalism in the U.S. Um, you know, even like the births of new religions, like the Scientologists, you know, L. Ron Harper said, yeah, you want to make money? Start a religion. You know, you know, and you know the abuses there are perpetuating. So. I think this is one of the great dilemmas of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has always tried to deny change. It has always tried to say that this is the truth, this is already what was there in the New Testament, and it hasn't changed at all since. Right. And this, of course, when you look into it, is, is completely nonsense. nonsense. Because everything changes. Right. You know, it's, it's Heraclitus already saw everything flows. Yeah. Well, I did the same the, the, the section of my book, uh, so for people who are watching, uh, so I've written a book on the history of the Catholic Church. Um, it was meant to be a chapter bridging classical antiquity and the Renaissance, but I've made it its own book, bringing it right up to today. So John is kindly reading it for me right now. Um, on my section on Vatican II, or, or on the 20th century, so you have the rise of the modernists, basically from about the time of Pope Leo in like the 1890s up through uh, the 1950s, you have this group called the modernists, and uh, more specifically, the Nouvelle Theology, who are saying you know, yes, we can use history to understand Catholicism, that history is a part of our faith. It doesn't have to necessarily be uh, be a bad thing. But, you know, you had like these conservative traditionalists who were saying, no, we can't do anything that might might challenge. But they, they were kept saying that history is a part of the Catholic faith and we shouldn't be afraid of it. We should be embracing it and, and showing, yes, how it has changed. That was that was one of their their major points was that yes, it has changed. And you know, as I mentioned, you know, with with the Council of Clouds uh, and the Counter Reformation, there was change there. Yes, there were some negative aspects. You know, you know, you have the index of prohibited books that comes out of the Counter Reformation. Um, other other nasty things that happened that escape my my memory at the moment. But there were good things like the establishment of seminaries to train priests properly the foundation of the Jesuits and a solid mm. educational background. All of this comes out of the Reformation and it's good change that needs that, you know, they should not be afraid to recognize that. That should be something they embrace and not be afraid of it. Let me 
give put in a little plug here for the new Jerome Biblical Commentary. Have you seen it? The Jerome oh, Biblical Commentary for the 21st century. Uh, there were four of us editors. Don Senior, who was really the, the moving force behind it. And then uh, Barbara Reed and Gina Hens Piazza and myself. And Don Senior, who was a priest in Chicago, has died just last year, I think. Uh, uh, but he wrote a, a very fine essay in it on you know, the attitudes to scripture in the Catholic Church and how they changed really since the modernist controversy. And, um, you know, I think, I think it would be fair to say that uh, this Jerome biblical commentary is a monument of the more liberal side of Catholicism. There are one or two more conservative voices in it we actually tried to be conclusive, but we ended up, I think, being all very much more on the liberal end of the spectrum. Uh, but I think, and you know, if you are looking into uh, a full history of the Catholic Church, uh, I would recommend that you have a look at that, and especially at Don Senior's essay in it. I will I'll check that out. Thanks for that. <laughs> Good, quick question. You, so you taught at the Divinity School at Yale. So you're teaching Old Testament criticism, but presumably not everybody you're teaching is necessarily a divinity major. You have people who just maybe are religious scholars or historical scholars. But for those that were actually in the divinity program, were you seeing a, a willingness on their part to acknowledge and recognize these historical facts? Or were some of them very resistant to that? Well, let me give you a little breakdown, first of all, of the makeup of Yale Divinity School, as it has been in uh, more or less the last 25 years. Uh, you know, it was founded as a professional school for training Protestant ministers. It has moved a long way past that. So at the moment, there are two major programs, the Master of Divinity, and the Master of Arts and Religion. Now, the Master of Divinity is, in theory, at least geared towards preparing people for ordination. But uh, at various times in the last 25 years, uh, there have been a very large group of Catholics there who are not going for ordination at all, and whose training at Yale would not count towards preparation for for ordination, at least it wouldn't count in lieu of, of seminary training. Uh, but the, then the other half, the Master of Arts and Religion people, these are people you know, with an interest in religion. Uh, many of them might be interested in environmental issues or might intend to work for nonprofits or go on to do PhDs in any aspect of the study of religion. So coming back to the divinity wing, uh, the biggest group are Episcopalians, and that's because Berkeley Divinity School was absorbed into Yale uh, back in the 1960s, I think it was. Uh, and more recently, we've also uh, taken in Andover Newton, which was a congregational seminary. But the, there is a very large block of Episcopalians who I would say tend to be very liberal. Uh, now, they might be, um, some of them might be a little bit post-liberal. They might be inclined to emphasize a more reverent attitude to scripture, but I've never really encountered any uh, opposition from them towards, um, towards taking the Bible historically. Then we'd have a small number of evangelical scholars who generally keep their heads down and stay quiet because uh, <laughs> at what they think, we don't know. <laughs> so that's kind of the makeup. But I'd say that so, the great majority of them, you know, accept the, the historical approach to the Bible. Uh, my introduction is used in uh, adult education by a lot of Episcopalians. 
So we do say it's so many Catholics, but my my understanding. So not everybody may may know what an Episcopalian <laughs> is. My understanding of an Episcopalian, and please correct me if this is wrong. That's the American term for an Anglican. Is is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. And they will refer so for to anybody watching who doesn't know what an Episcopalian is. They're just they're American Anglicans. They refer to themselves as part of the Anglican Communion, right? And go on pilgrimage to Westminster around Easter okay. time or spring break. <laughs> okay. So the people in the divinity program who are preparing for ordination, they can be from any faith. They don't necessarily have to be Episcopalian or right. Presbyterian. It, it, they can come from any tradition and study we, there. We even occasionally, very rarely, but occasionally get a Jewish student doing the mastery of divinity. Now, I don't think that would, would count towards uh, training for if they wanted to become rabbis uh, but you know we have had one or two at least who wanted to go into other forms of ministry in Judaism and occasionally you would get a, a Jewish student who comes along just kind of to learn about Christianity and so you were saying you you were getting large groups of Catholics, but not going for ordination. So was, was there any reason for for them? They just were they just interested, or well, no, they would want to go into religious education. They might want to teach in Catholic high schools or work in um, work for a diocese, become journalists okay. in some cases. You know, there are many different ways. And we have also had, I have to say, quite a number of Catholic women who ended up becoming Episcopalians. <laughs> they want to get ordained. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, by and large, you know, that, that this is a, a group of people that I like very much and get along very well with. Uh, I don't know. The, you maybe you've heard this i just it just popped into my head um robin williams my favorite comedian robin yeah. williams described himself in one of his comedy routines as episcopalian which is catholic light <laughs> well and you, you may know that there is a joke about uh, somebody who dies and is with saint peter in the seas groups of people uh going along who are being condemned to, to hell. And one large group is Catholics who ate meat on Fridays. <laughs> and then there's a smaller group of Episcopalians who ate their, their main course with their salad fork. <laughs> Never heard this, that joke before. That this was what counted as a mortal sin. <laughs> But no, on, yeah, the, on the whole, I think, you know, these have been a very, very nice group of people to work with. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there are certainly, I'm sure there are some conservatives uh, around in the student body, but I've never, we've never had any friction over that. So they're, they're generally accepting, other than like a small group of evangelicals who just keep their head down, as you said. Yes, the majority are, are open and accepting of, of what they're learning. Now, I have a number of former students who teach in the southern part of the US, and they have a very different experience. You know, they will often like, encounter like the Baptist hostility. Church. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can see that. And to me, it's 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 much more interesting to teach the actual textual historical, you know, version of the Bible, like what you write about. That's a much more interesting story than like, you know, just, oh, this literally happened. There yeah. was, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you remember, uh, you've probably heard of him, uh, Rabbi David Wolpe from Sinai Temple in Los Angeles. Have you, do you know that name? You know, I've probably heard of him, but uh, I don't have a, a clear recollection as to, to what I've heard of him. He's, he's been on, I've seen him on a number of talk shows. I think he even debated Christopher Hitchens once. Uh, in 2001, he did a Passover sermon that just, both Jews and Christians lost their minds because he said the Exodus historically never really happened. I remember that. But, yeah. but his, and his key point was, what's the message of the story? The message of the story is life is hard. We're suffering. There's light at the end of the tunnel. So he's, you know, he can at least divorce 
the the literal interpretations from the meaning of the story and say even while people got upset he can say look there's still benefit to this story that can be had even if you don't accept it like you know the literal historicity of it so and i i really i i i like that analogy of his that he said like you can you can take it away and just look at what's the moral of the story that they're trying the lesson they're trying to teach you so and i think we need i remember more of that. The, the controversy that followed on that and it amused me at the time because it's a very prominent uh, jewish scholar whom i will not name uh who you know was well known for his own critical reading of the tradition. But he was one of the people who had a fit and said, you know, you can't deny the historicity of the Exodus. <laughs> Even though his own scholarship would certainly go in that direction. But still, well, even, you know, at a see, certain point, there is a tug of the, the DNA or yeah. uh, the genes. <laughs> Well, even the, the Israel Museum, there, there. I think it was 2016. Their 2016 uh, Exodus exhibit was an empty room. So even the Israel Museum is saying there's no evidence for this. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, well, I, I can. I under, I know why people are. You know, they want to yeah. fight. They, you know, they believe it. So, you know, but yeah. you know, some education is good. So, which is why you know we like to read your books and have you come on the podcast and and help spread that knowledge for people. So. Okay, well, it's been about an hour, and I know you, you probably want to go and get started on your day, and I need to wrap up mine. So I think right, you well, probably need to have dinner, and I need to have breakfast. Yeah, <laughs> the benefits of living on the other side of the world. Well, right. thank you, John, for, for coming on. I really appreciate your your time, the suggestion, like the the the, the New Jerome scholarship. So I'll, I'll check that out and review it. So, um, and you know, send me when you finish the manuscript with okay. the. You send it to me again. I will. I'll give us another look. Okay. Yeah, I'm still like I'm still doing some some additions. I'm working. I'm doing the Cathars today. Um, the what the person who edited said you don't even mention the Cathars. They should probably at least get a paragraph. So I'm, okay. I'm working on no that, that section today. Yeah. There is no end to it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. A pleasure to talk to you, Jason. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Check out John's books. I'll put some links in the description to some of his books, introduction, uh, short introduction. Uh, Scepter in the Star is a great book if you're interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the, the Messianic passages. So please check out his work. Check out his other podcasts online, and we'll see everybody next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. Please check out the other videos on my channel if history is your thing, and see you next time.